series, um, which we've called the Opportunity Show. And the focus really is here um, to provide some positive and future focused um, content for you, which is looking at both current and future opportunities for red meat farmers in central Otago. Um, however, a lot of the stuff that we'll present is equally applicable New Zealand wide. So tonight's focus, as you'll be aware, is um, adding value to red meat. So we're going to look, um, delve into some consumer insights and trends, learn a little bit more about claims versus reality around alternative proteins, and also hear from our two major meat companies about what consumers are telling them that they value in a red meat product. You'll be hearing from three fantastic speakers tonight. Um, joining us, we've got Jacqueline Roth from Lincoln University. We have Danny Hales from Alliance and Ryan MacArthur from Silverburn Farms. And also sitting in the background um, is Dean Cinnamon, uh, the new extension manager for the Otago region. Um, if you haven't used Zoom before, just a couple of things to note. Um, hopefully you already have your microphone muted and your camera off. Um, that just reduces distraction. Um, but also, if you have any questions throughout tonight's webinar, if you just click on the chat box, which is down the very bottom of your screen, um, if you just move your mouse a little bit and then go down to that chat box, if you've got any questions, just please type them into the chat box and we'll address them at the end of all of the presentations. Um, also, at the end, Dean's just going to put up a little poll regarding your preferred format in terms of follow-up after today's session. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to get into it. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Jacqueline Roth. We're very privileged to be joined um, tonight by Jacqueline. She is an adjunct professor at Lincoln University. She's also a director on the board of both Fonterra and Ravensdown. Um, and you might have heard her in the news formerly as Chief Scientist of the Environmental Protection Authority, um, and also she's been Professor at Massey University, so lots of roles. Um, and amongst her busy life, Jacqueline also fo closely follows the global food sector and has a very good working knowledge of international food and consumer trends, which is why we've got her on tonight. Um, she's recently published a paper investigating the role of alternative proteins as part of future farming um, and will today provide some insight into what she's learned and why New Zealand red meat um, is well positioned as a high value natural and sustainably produced product. I'll hand over to you Jacqueline. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Great pleasure to be with you but Dairy NZ not Fonterra. Just a little bit of a difference. And I'm really pleased to be on Dairy NZ and trying to do what beef and land does, but for the dairy sector. And of course, talk with all farmers uh, about good nutrient use, including greenhouse gases. And this is our problem because we've been labeled as the animal sector since the early 2000s. You remember Livestock's Long Shadow, which came out from the FAO, and you might have thought they'd have done some better calculations, but they said that livestock were creating more greenhouse gases than the whole of the transport sector. It's the sort of thing that makes my blood boil, or after I thought, well, how could that possibly be? And the answer is because they looked at just fuel consumption in the transport sector, but the whole of the life cycle analysis for animals. So it's just a daft calculation. But I'm showing you one that I don't know that is very much better. This came out in 2018, beef and lamb right at the top in terms of having the biggest carbon footprint. And sometimes it's nice to be at the top of the record, but actually when it comes to this sort of thing, I start wondering what they're trying to show. And clearly, it was that we need to get rid of animals from our plates. Beef and lamb have the highest impact, though they make the point that there is a range from low to high. They do make the point that a chocolate bar from deforested rainforest emits more than a serving of low impact beef. But they really like vegetables down here. And vegetables are very, very important, but they are not the same as good quality accessible protein. And my goal here is to give you some of the facts and allow you in the supermarket checkout when people start saying we should be giving up beef and lamb to make the arguments about their health. 
but I'd like to ask you to stare at this and think, what does a serving of beef mean or lamb in comparison with a serving of beer or some delicious coffee and perhaps some not so delicious tofu? And here we are talking about kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions per serving. It's just a nonsense unit because, of course, they mean servings give you different amounts of different things. And I, as an agricultural scientist, have been trying to feed the world sustainably. Well, that's why I went into it with my A-levels back in the UK, to learn about agriculture and to learn about how we can feed people sustainably. We're not going to do it through coffee, delicious as it might be. Now that's interesting. I have now, ah, so we learn in 2019 that 33% of New Zealanders are ditching meat. Did I mention when I read headlines or hear nonsense stuff we get, um, my, makes my blood boil? It just didn't seem very sensible. And yet it was on scoop and then all over all sorts of news, including RNZ, which should have known better. 33% of people in New Zealand giving up meat not logical. And when we see the research published in 2020, and this research was looking at the um, 15,000 uh, people, 13,000 people, and what they were eating and what their intentions were over a year. So 12,500 omnivores, half, uh, 553 vegetarians and 149 vegans. Yeah. So it was quite a lot of people involved. But during the year, 121 of the omnivores became vegetarian, but 125 changed back. And that is actually the story all over the place. 23 people became vegan, but 24 changed back. And even with the vegetarians who eat no meat and the vegans who eat no animal products, 17 became vegan and 20 turned back. So when we read about 33% of people intending to ditch meat, the reality is that they don't. And last year in the UK, only 2% of the people who said they were going to become vegan actually did. So we get the shock horror headlines, but the reality supports what we're doing, producing good quality protein. And when we read these sorts of headlines, a record year for plant-based cultivated meat and sustainable protein companies, we know that a record when there isn't a very much of an industry is actually quite difficult and quite easy to achieve. And when a new industry is starting, of course, it can double very quickly. So what does it actually mean? Well, it turned out it didn't mean very much because by the end of last year, we were hearing that the shares had fallen in all the synthetic companies, the Beyond Meats crashed because they'd missed deadlines, their costs were too high, and actually the stuff didn't taste very good. I hope you're feeling positive about your future because natural is the most sought after label, and this is globally. The International Food Information Council looks at different countries around the world, America, Mexico, France, and somewhere in Asia. And they've said the thing that everybody wants um, certainly is taste. Then they get to health. Actually, sustainability is only about 30% of them looking for that. But the sought after label is natural. And when you look at the plant-based like sunfed chicken, for instance, any of those plant-based um, patties or whatever else they do with them, ch chunks, you have Tassili, and they come from um, Canada, by the way, the P isolate, because we any gold here, because my plant suit, functionalization, add the E if you want the stuff to bleed, formulate it up, squish it up with its potatoes and its wheat and that P isolate, Add all the fine binders and fat, make it into patties or extrude it into um, spaghetti type things. Does that sound like natural? Not to me. And cultured meat's even more interesting. Stem cell isolation, genetic engineering for the yeast that will enable the cell proliferation, and then tissue perfusion. They actually have to put a scaffolding to allow the cells to uh, sort of accumulate in large vats. Exponential growth of the satellite cell. 
Again, does it sound like natural? Not to me. But the claims are so fantastic and incredible, and I use the terms appropriately because they're claiming that these new proteins use 99% less land, 96% less water, 45% less energy, and there aren't any bugs or antibiotics or any of those sorts of things. Lovely. Could it be real? Well, in the fats, well, when it's plant-based, clearly we've got plants involved, so we need some land. If we're talking about the vats, the precision fermentation, then we need sugars, amino acids, we need animal yeast uh, blood, and we need genetically engineered yeast. Could I draw your attention back to sugar? Where does that come from? It comes from the soil. We need to cultivate we need to add the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium. We need to do the weed and pest and control. Of course, we need greenhouse gases to do all of that. And then we have the whole harvesting and the processing. So does it sound hmm, natural? We've agreed it doesn't. But do we ever hear amount of sugar they need? So all those claims are completely bizarre. And the claims are uh, fundamentally looking at only this component, the land footprint of the factory. They're looking at none of the um, materials that come in, the imprint of those, and they don't bother about the ex their life cycle analysis. It's only the factory. So I hope you feel very good about that. So next time somebody says, yes, but what about the impact? You can point it out. It's called greenwashing. They're not doing a life cycle analysis. You could also point out the minute we've got fossil fuels, we've got carbon dioxide that stays in the atmosphere for a very long time. Whereas with our animals, we know the methane, well, about 60% of it has gone within 12 years. We tend to talk about it mostly having gone in 20 years. In fact, 2% will still be around in 50 years. And why can't we be more precise about that? Because it depends what other gases are around. And it, um, yeah, it, the longevity of, is affected by everything that's around it. What we know is that if we can stabilize animals in New Zealand within about 20 years, we won't be adding to warming anymore. And in fact, we are on that path. Some of the calculations from Hewaka Ekenoa would reckon we'll be on a stabilized platform within five or six years and be able to keep going in terms of thinking how we explain to society in general that actually. We're pretty good and we're not adding any more. But the really wonderful calculation is actually the reality for stainless steel vats. Stainless steel is going to come from where? We're having trouble getting it into the country at the moment and the energy required is huge. But meeting a mere 10% of the world's meat demand, that's 40 metric, uh, million metric tons by 2030, will require 4,000 factories, each costing. 382 million euro. So where's that money coming from? More debt? The houses and the perfusion tanks and the need for 2.3 million litres of cell culture in each factory when our current largest facility hosts only about um, 250,000 litres, maybe 350. This is so far beyond what we can do at the moment that people saying, as Chris Hurabai did talking to TV3 this morning, dairy is going to be um, a dodo in two, in two decades, it's just nonsense. We have not got the facilities to be able to replace things. And why would you? When actually a very sustainable diet, in fact, our best diet, has more of the animal protein in it. So here, CSIRO, the Australian CRI, is looking at what diet should we be having for least impact in terms of water and land area and soil carbon and biodiversity. And they're saying this is the average diet. This is the diet people should be eating. Eat more red meat, eat more dairy, but cut down on your fast food. And then all the things, water, soil, biodiversity, will be better off. Why? Because you're fed properly. Beef, 
100 grams of raw steak, which you could eat in steak tartare. There's your usable protein. 100 grams of dry quinoa. Nat, because that's dry and you need three cups of water for every one cup of quinoa. So that's cut down to, what, four grams. Eat meat. And by the way, look at all the greenhouse gases for fractionation, soaking, etc. Scientists have done the calculations. If you got rid of animals in America, you would grow more food, but plant-based food, but it meets less of the nutrient requirements. There would be more nutrient deficiencies. They would need to eat more calories. And White and Hall said, actually, that wouldn't be good for most Americans. They're already eating too many calories. And actually, vegans excrete more nitrogen because of their wasted amino acids when they're trying to scavenge the essential ones. And that's greenhouse ga gas implications. Almost three quarters of the essential amino acids in the food, food supply come from animals. 34% of global protein consumption, but only 18% of calories. And look at all the other things that were produced. Alison Motet produced this paper, she's FAO, trying to counteract the livestock's long shadow. People need us for their health. And that's why I think the message needs changing. We need to be talking, not trying to convince society in general that we're good guys, particularly if we're from the dairy sector, that's quite challenging. But we create what the world needs in terms of essential amino acids. And we need to focus on the benefits to the consumer of their health, good essential amino acids for few calories, the environment, because we hold the records, the good records for least greenhouse gas in meat and milk in the world. And of course, the economy, because New Zealanders can't get by without what we produce in terms of their lifestyles. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, that was incredibly insightful. And um, thanks to you, I'm sure none of our attendees will be rushing out to the supermarket for a vegan burger <laughs> after this. Um, I know everyone will probably have a lot of questions for you. So please, if you do have a question, just hover your mouse, um, click on the chat button down the bottom of your screen and type your question in and we'll address those at the end. Um, thank you, Jacqueline. Our next speaker is Danny Hales. Um, Danny is part of the executive leadership team at the Alliance Group, and his role is general manager of livestock and shareholder services. Danny's joining us this evening to provide some insight into what Alliance is hearing from its customers in terms of what they value in a red meat product and what they're willing to pay a premium for. Thanks, Danny. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Nicola, and thanks, Jacqueline. That was a great presentation. Um, and welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. What I'm going to talk about uh, briefly tonight is about premium products, which um, have been developed as part of Alliance Group's strategy to differentiate red meat. Our farmer shareholders have told us that they want to be rewarded really well for their, uh, for the, for the, um, the products that they produce. And we've gone to our customers and consumers and said, what is it that you want and you're prepared to pay for? And uh, those uh, customers and consumers have, have told us, and what we've done is we've gone back to farmers and said, look, uh, if you can produce animals uh, with these particular attributes, um, the market is prepared to pay a premium and we will direct that premium uh, back to you. So thanks. We just go to the next slide. So in terms of our um, in terms of our uh, premium range, first of all, we have handpicked lamb, which we launched um, last year. We have the Salia lamb, which is a uh, a product uh, for uh, merino lambs. We have lumina lambs which are high in omega-3 and uh, involve animals being finished on chicory. We have a hand-picked beef range. We have a 21-day age and 55-day age beef. The 55-day age beef won three gold medals uh, last year at the World Steak uh, Championships in uh, Ireland. Our Angus beef and also our Wagyu beef. Next, thanks, Dean.
So we've seen uh, just in the last year a significant growth in uh, our premium and demand and uh, also the supply for our premium supply of our premium products. So in relation to our, our premium land portfolio, we've seen a growth of 54% last year on the year before. Our Angus and Wagyu programs, which we launched uh, last year, um, we expect those to, uh, given that the interest we have in those, we expect those to build on the success of our overall beef portfolio. And uh, for any of you who are deer farmers, we uh, are planning to launch a hand-picked uh, venison program uh, to come. So next slide, thanks, Dean. Now, of course, at the end of the day, farmers want to be rewarded well for what they do. And so by uh, producing uh, products that, um, that, that the consumers and our customers want and are prepared to pay for, to pay a premium, we've been able to establish premiums for these products. So they hand-packed, all those animals will be antibiotic-free or raised without antibiotics is, a, is another way of describing it. We pay a premium of 15 cents for that, plus on top of that, a premium of 15 cents per kilogram for uh, 15 cents per kilogram for um, for the uh, um, for for the uh, hand picked lamb and uh, the Salia product, which is the the merino product. We have a premium of 40 cents per kg. Uh, that's on top of the uh, published schedule. And for uh, Angus, we have uh, the Angus Beef Program. We have a range of 10 cents, uh, 10 cents to 40 cents, which is, uh, which is the, um, uh, depending on the time of year and the weight range that the animals hit. And then handpicked beef, we have a premium of 80 cents per kg uh, on, on top of the schedule price. And for a 55 day age beef, it's a dollar per kg. Um, the Wagyu, uh, um, yeah, I was gonna say, Nicola, can you, or Dean, can you put the, um, can you put the slides back up? Got something else up there, which is, that's it, thank you. So the Wagyu payment uh, matrix, so depending on exactly what, um, in terms of the marbling score that animals hit and depending on the fat color, which are two critical components to the Wagyu, it's the color of the fat um, consumers of Wagyu are particularly interested in a white fat. Um, and of course, uh, marbling, the greater the marbling, then uh, the more desired the product. So you can see from the matrix there that the uh, premium ranges, and this is cents per kg on top of the schedule ruling schedule price, range from 40 cents per kg up to $3. So uh, having a uh, optimal fat color and marbling score sees uh, farmers hitting a $3 per kg premium. Okay, Dean, we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So the key consumer demands for premium meat uh, eating quality attributes. So it's really important, I guess, for us to understand what it is that um, consumers are demanding, what they're looking for. Uh, the three key aspects of this are tenderness, succulence, and flavor. Um, and so really it's important that in terms of producing a product, it's gotta be good to eat. It's got to be uh, sustainable. It's got to be um, consumers uh, like the idea of a uh, product having a, a, a low carbon footprint. But at the end of the day, it has to be a great eating experience. And to achieve that great experience, it's got to be tender, it's got to be succulent, and it's got to be flavorsome. And so there's a number of aspects. Clearly, the meat pH and the aging and time temperature um, uh, impact the tenderness, the succulence again, the pH and product composition. So the, the bubbling or intramuscular fat, 
and then flavour, a combination of the pH, the intramuscular fat, the sex and the age of the animal, and of course the livestock production feed system. And then uh, on overlaid over those three key aspects is a consistency of standardised production system and controls in place both on farm and in the processing plant. Now there are levers that we can pull in terms of achieving these things both on farm and also in the processing plant. Thanks team, we'll go to the next slide. So on farm, pH is influenced by the animal sex and the handling of the animal. Um, in terms of uh, entire males are prone to high pH. So pH levels above 5.8, our programs we refer to 5.7 or less. Um, so anything 5.8 and over may have a negative influence on the eating attributes. Um, and in terms of our, for example, our lamb, premium lamb program, the hand-packed, uh, we exclude um, crypt orchids and also uh, ram lambs. So use and, and weathers are selected only for, for that program for this reason. Intramuscular fat is influenced obviously by animal genetics, but also the conditioning and finish of the animals, the maturity, the sex, and also the feed system. Uh, the flavour, Differentiation within the premium programs are achieved by the livestock production system and obviously the maturity of the animal. Intensity of flavour is of course increased with the maturity of the animal and the feed systems can also use influence. And uh, for example, there's good data to show that certain feeds will um, certainly have an influence on, on flavour. Going to the processing plant, the grading systems uh, for carcass weight and determining fat cover and conformation, um, marbling or intramuscular fat, and of course the pH and, uh, and fat color. So the Alliance premium programs will hand, will hand pick carcasses through a selection program for weight, uh, the fat cover, conformation at the grading station and through additional selection process through uh, chiller assessments uh, of the particular carcasses and cuts, as the case may be, um, in the boning room. So meat ageing process for tenderness uh, is also, uh, has also been developed, and the ageing process involves uh, what we describe as a wet ageing regime and vacuum pack or shrink bags. So that's it. I think I'm. Uh, I think that's 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 me. So thank you. Um, if anybody is interested in any of these premium products, then um, happy to uh, offline take any inquiries. And obviously, your local alliance group rep uh, representative will be able to give you all the information on it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Danny. Um, it's really interesting to hear about the intricacies of producing a high quality red meat product and how you achieve this consistently. So thank you. Um, once again, a reminder to pop your questions in the chat box for the end of session. Um, next up, we have Ryan MacArthur. So um, Ryan works for Silvern Farms um, in the role of on-farm sustainability manager. And tonight he's going to provide some insight into the value add programs that Silfern Farms have, um, and in particular focusing on one which provides premiums based on sustainability attributes, that being the zero carbon beef program. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Nicola, and, and um, good to hear there from both Jacqueline and, and Danny around um, particularly some of those more um, nutrient and, and flavour based attributes that um, New Zealand as a country is, is doing a fantastic job of, of continuing to market um, internationally. Look, tonight I'm, I'm going to briefly discuss um, some of our sustainability commitments and, and our associated livestock programmes that we're rolling out to silver fern farm suppliers. Um, sustainability program offerings are, are the latest means by which we're differentiating our products and market. Our market-led plate to pasture strategy uh, means we're, we're constantly looking at those demands of our consumers and the programs I'll cover off to this evening demonstrate how we're working alongside our suppliers uh, to meet the demands 
of, of discerning customers who are, are becoming more environmentally conscious and concerned with on-farm practices um, in which the meat that they purchase is, is raised. So last year at, at Silver Fern Farms, we made a commitment to eight regenerative agriculture principles. Um, this is minimising soil disturbance, optimising biodiversity, managing our livestock grazing practices, protecting and regenerating our soil health, optimising animal welfare, nurturing our farming communities, protecting and enhancing our natural resources, and reducing our carbon footprint. And look, we, we know that this is a journey many of our suppliers are already on, and we want to ensure that we capture the most value for the work they're already doing. And so these principles are fundamental to ensuring we have a sustainable livestock supply that meets the needs of, of today's consumer. So we're measure, measuring and, and validating those practices is an integral part of ensuring we prove what we're doing. Um, to realise this, we're, we're supporting a group of suppliers to complete the Savory Institute's land to market accreditation. And it's a, a leading um, US accreditation body for, for regenerative agriculture. So that's to, to measure on farm and verify um, that the practices relating to these eight principles um, are, are being carried out on farm, but also showing signs of improvement. The next is really around um, New Zealand Farm Assurance Plus program. So we're underpinning those eight principles with this program, which we believe um, addresses, addresses these really well. And the New Zealand Farm Assurance Plus program builds on the existing um, NZFAP program that, that many farmers on the call will be familiar with. It's an industry standard which under FAP uh, covers off origin and traceability, food safety, and animal health and welfare. So FAP is a, a, an add-on to that, it's a higher level sustainability focused standard, which uh, audits farms on, on three additional areas. That's farm environment, uh, people, and biosecurity. FAP is it's, it's a journey, it's, it's not just a destination. So you don't have to be done to get into FAP plus certified. You just need, need to be able to show that you're on your way and, and showing signs of improvement and commitment to that continuous improvement. We see this as being able to unlock extra value for us in market as well. It ensures transparency and, and assurances in relation to environmental standards. And the NZFAP Plus framework allows us to demonstrate that our farmers are farming in a way that meets these expectations while continuously improving in the areas covered by the program. And we're growing, uh, our growing farm sustainability team here at Silver Firm Farms is providing support to those suppliers that are wishing to work through the program. So we're really getting in behind this program and we believe that it can help our farmers. It's well aligned to incoming regulation. Um, so it's, it's a double-edged sword in terms of being able to address regulation and those concerns of our customers. It's an industry-wide standard. It's, it's not a Silver Firm Farm specific standard. Um, and, and it's owned by an organisation called New Zealand Farm Assurance Incorporated, which is made up of the respective meat companies. And so it's something I'd encourage all farmers, irrespective of your supply company, to look at doing. And, and as I said, it's a fantastic way for remaining on top of, of the plethora of regulatory changes that are, are coming our way at the moment. And the net carbon zero by nature is, it's a new program for soil food farms, and it's demonstrating the in-market opportunities that we're realising regarding sustainability-based credentials. It's an innovative program, challenges the typical livestock supply programs um, that we've previously seen, and it rewards farmers for, for farm practices, on-farm practices beyond the norm. The first step in developing a, a net carbon zero offering is conducting a, a life cycle assessment of that program, um, similar to what Jacqueline referred to earlier. So that assessment measures the greenhouse gas emissions both from, from basically birth of calf or lamb right through to end of life of that product. So that's everything from production, shipping, and uh, consuming a kilogram at this stage of our 100% Angus beef into the North American market. And we're measuring, reporting, and reducing on those emissions. So currently, um, working off our Angus program, we know that, that it sits around 33 kgs of CO2 equivalents per kg of meat sent up to that US market. And 96% of those emissions are currently sitting on farm. 
So to bring this product to net carbon zero, we're utilizing a unique approach, um, which we're terming this insetting. And that means the carbon credits needed to offset the emissions of the product are found by working with farmers to optimize the role that the farms, where the animals are raised, can play in acting as carbon sinks, rather than having to rely on purchasing carbon credits from other projects. We're utilizing satellite technology aided by increasingly sophisticated artificial intelligence software, which has been used to measure on-farm vegetation to within about 0.5 of a meter. And that enables a calculation of each individual farm's ability to sequester carbon. The on-farm uh, vegetation, that, that includes the likes of your woodlot forests, shelter belts, uh, we're looking at regenerative native bush, summer shade and winter animal shelter, um, erosion and, and riparian planting. So all of those non-ETS uh, qualifying areas. And this carbon sequestration is then contracted off the farm to provide the sequestration and deliver a net carbon zero offering to the market. So we've partnered with New Zealand's premier agriculture science institute, Ag Research, which a number you'll be familiar with, um, who have supported the pro, um, product certification and the product is fully certified as net carbon zero by New Zealand's most trusted uh, environmental verification body, Toyota and BioCare. And then in addition to this, uh, to sell into the US, it's also USDA approved. In setting, in my eyes, is pivotal. It's about taking care of our own emissions um, responsibility. It's no one else's. We're not outsourcing our emissions, rather we're recognizing and incentivizing our farmers for their efforts to create farm environments that are better able to capture carbon, increase biodiversity, and support a nature positive food production system. And we've recently released this net carbon zero by nature range into uh, North America. Um, and then, uh, so that's under our 100% Angus program, and we've got land, our 100% land program and our venison uh, next on our list. You'll see our um, beef EQ label on the packaging there, and that's our scientifically um, based grading system to ensure that the cut of meat on the plate will be exceptional. So it currently supports an existing range of our premium branded programs and is now being further enhanced by maintaining that EQ system, but also putting a net carbon zero offering on top of that. So the net carbon zero by nature product is now on the shelves in North America. Um, we're doing that through our Angus ribeye and New York strip steaks some ground beef and other cuts. Uh, they're available in supermarkets throughout New York and Los Angeles. Uh, we recently had 134 Jolosco supermarkets across the Midwestern US um, take stock of the product. And on release in late January uh, this year, the New York Post published a two-page spread backed by some of the local retailers that was um, advertising and promotion of this net carbon zero offering um, that, that we weren't even required to, to pay for. So the retailers are really getting in behind this. We're seeing fantastic sales of the product and uh, looking forward to sharing the, the future opportunities such offerings can deliver um, for our shareholders and, and farmer suppliers. So I'll, uh, I'll hand that back to you, Nicola. Awesome, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in, so that's really awesome. But um, yeah, firstly, thanks very much. It was really great to um, hear that Soil Fern Farms is striving to get value from the things that farmers are working really hard towards in the, in the sustainability space, and in particular in the greenhouse gas space as well. Um, if you're wondering what Ryan's talking about regarding greenhouse gas emissions, um, we plug for the Beef and Lamb workshop. So Beef and Lamb New Zealand are running um, greenhouse gas workshops for farmers at the moment. Um, and there you'll learn a bit more about what greenhouse gas emissions are, where they come from and what your number actually is. Um, so yeah, definitely sign up for those. And I know Silver Fern Farms have been really great at um, supporting and getting farmers through those workshops, which is awesome. Um, once again, a reminder just to your questions in the chat box. Um, I have a couple here. So if Jenny and Declan, if you wouldn't mind um, unmuting yourselves. Um, I've got a question for Jenny. 
Um, what proportion of lambs processed this season have entered the hand-picked lamb program versus lambs just being processed as usual? So thanks for that. Good questions. A little bit commercially sensitive, but if I can say several hundred thousand lambs are in the hand-picked program uh, this season. Uh, so far, and we'll take more, and uh, we'll, we'll take more. Cool. Thanks, Danny. Um, I've got a question here for Ryan from Tara Dwyer. Um, how frequently do the farms supplying the Net Carbon Zero program get their system re-audited? Yeah, good question. So um, there's sort of two sides to that, around the life cycle assessment. So that's recalculating the footprint of that whole product. Um, that's an annual calculation that we do both from an on-farm data collection and modelling perspective and through our uh, processing and, and logistics and retail side of that. Um, but we also re-measure that carbon sequestration on an annual basis on those farms. So that was the importance of being able to do that um, remotely using that artificial intelligence rather than an, an on-the-ground um, assessment so that enables us to, to have high volumes of carbon removals being supplied from multiple um, farmers without the need to, to be on the ground doing that. Cool, thanks Ryan. Um, and another carbon related one for you from James Roberts, Robson. Um, in the zero carbon program, does grass absorb any carbon? Yeah, the, the age old question. Um, Look, at this stage, no, we're, we're focusing on that woody vegetation, and that's just because the a lot of the markets we're selling into don't recognise the carbon sequestration that is going on um, with our pasture. Uh, we are certainly keen to get that included in time. It's probably just a matter of more science to back um, what those carbon sequestration rates are. Cool, thank you. James, you need to come along to one of our workshops, Greenhouse Gas one. Um, I want to add something there okay. because it's not the grass that's sequestering. It could be or might be the soil. But the soil is also releasing carbon because there are soil, the microorganisms are there and all the worms that we really, really want. So actually the soil is mostly uh, at a dynamic equilibrium. So it's not gaining, but it's not the pasture per se because if you have, you know, the 1st of June every year, you've got about the same amount of cover every year. So there is no sequestration in the grass, though your tree would be getting bigger every time you go and look at it on a yearly basis. Soil is a different matter, but because of drought, we lose a lot of carbon every year. And so soil scientists, of which I am one, would say do not touch it at the moment until we can be much more certain that you're actually gaining and that you're gaining on a regular um, way that we can sort of help you with prediction. In general, don't touch it at the moment. Trees are fine, but not certainly not pasture and soil is a problem. Awesome, thanks Jacqueline. Um, and another question while we've got you on, um, marketing related. So from Erin Chen, uh, one thing that kept, caught my eye was a perceived natural aspect of plant-based protein. My question is from a marketing perspective, to move our New Zealand red meat more forward to the international market, what would be our selling pitch grass-fed free from antibiotics or GMO um, compared with natural plant-based diets? That was the first part of that question. I think you can read it in the chat box. Yes, um, and Silver Firm Farms and Alliance and the other companies, they're already onto it. So is Fonterra. We are doing everything that consumers say they want. And I'm sure that our meat guys will be able to make some comment about whether there is or isn't a premium. Fonterra would say there is. That, and, and they reckon it's quite significant for their milk powders, but they're selling into premium markets or trying to. So the pitches, I'd say, um, just what we used to do. 
and try and, and uh, just what we used to do to feed to you know feed rather fewer people frankly but just what we used to do and it's that's all that's all the the um, grass-fed free from antibiotics GMO all of those sorts of things but low greenhouse gases so our low environmental impact the minute you're talking about the plant-based diet you have to have crops and the minute you have crops, you've got soil disturbance, greenhouse gases, you've got increased potential with erosion. You know that our biggest nitrogen loss and, and phosphorus and potassium, for that matter, is actually off our market gardens. And that's where your plants are growing. So we just need, without beating up any other sector, because plants are important, and some of you will know I'm vegetarian and have been since I was mm, 18, which is now some time ago, that we need to, um, to be saying that a balanced diet requires everything. But the thing that New Zealand does superbly is animal protein. We can't be beaten. Cool, oh, thanks, Jacqueline. And the second part of that question was, are international consumers really ready to pay for our premium products? And that's what I handed to the guys, but Fonterra reckons they are. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if Danny or Ryan want to comment on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just quickly comment about, look, um, you know, it's, we, we have a product with uh, what we call special raisin claims, which um, include antibiotic free or raised without antibiotics. Um, and um, obviously, uh, no um, HCPs, hormonal growth promotants, um, and, and grass fed. So there is just more and more um, demand for that. In fact, in terms of antibiotic free now, it's really sort of getting to the point where, you know, really it's just a ticket to the game. You've got to be antibiotic free to be to be playing in the North American market. That's where, it, where, where it's getting to. Yeah, I'd, I'd second Danny's comment. You know, we, we've got grass-fed um, ABF-free programs as well. And it's it's the same thing. Um, it's almost becoming the ticket to the game now. Um, it's no longer so much a, a differentiated supply. So yes, we realise premiums from that. And yes, we return those um, to our farmers through that program supply. Um, however, the, the North American market's got over 60 grass-fed offerings in it now. So it's no longer... That niche market that, that we're playing in so it's it's looking at what's the next big thing coming awesome thanks team um and one more question from tara before we wrap it up um what are soil fern farms and alliance doing to reduce plant emissions and energy consumption do you want to touch on that first danny and then, then we'll go to ryan yeah sure yeah hi hi tara um look uh, alliance group has got a significant program at its plants um firstly uh, in terms of um, getting out of uh, burning fossil fuels. And the, the obvious one is coal. And so we've given a commitment. Uh, we, in fact, we gave a commitment um, a couple of years ago that we would endeavour to be out of uh, burning coal uh, in our boilers um, at our plants of our seven processing plants. We have four plants where we burn coal. And so uh, the first one out of the blocks uh, of those four is likely to be the Matoda plant, where we're looking at uh, essentially going to going to heat pump. So um, so the first things uh, getting out of uh, coal fired boilers, and we think that we'll do it uh, uh, well within uh, that ten year uh, ten year commitment. Um, uh, in addition to that, we're also looking at. Um, uh, significant um, water saving measures in terms of recycling and just water water reduction, and looking at um, at, at uh, some other um, energy saving overall energy saving uh, measures across our network of plants. But the big one is getting out of burning coal. Awesome, thanks, Danny. Ryan, do you want to add something from Silver Fern's perspective? Yeah, very, very similar. Um, you know, we've made some public commitments around um, reduction targets that we've put in place. So that includes um, on our plants a 30% reduction on 2005 levels of greenhouse gas emissions intensity of our operations. And that's on a per tonne of product. Uh, and we're looking to do that before 2030, um, as well as a 10% reduction of energy use per kg of product. Um, 
there is commitments around reductions in water and, and wastewater um, per kg of product as well, and 10% and reduction uh, in waste to landfill. So there's commitments there equally um, looking to, to phase out coal as well. So um, part of our net carbon zero program is not just that we have a net carbon zero offering the market, it's actually that uh, under our TOIDO certification, we continue to reduce those emissions right across the supply chain, and that includes um, our plants and, and processing facilities as well. Awesome, that's great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, that brings us to the conclusion of our webinar today. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to our speakers, Jacqueline, Danny and Ryan. Um, I think this has been a really interesting session and I appreciate you um, all giving up your evening to speak to us.